Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Manley Partners Four Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will view all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, and I'm sure the company would be most grateful for your participation. And I'd now like to hand over to Stephen Cooklin, CEO. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, good afternoon to everyone on the call. Thank you so much to so many of you for joining us. Um, I have with me today uh, our CFO, Mark Kavanagh. Um, Mark, could you just introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Tavener. I'm a chartered accountant. I've spent most of my career uh, with Deloitte in the city, working on uh, within the corporate finance um, arena, and I've been with Manalay for the last uh, three years. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Mark. Um, so turning to the next slide, just to remind people who are new to the company, uh, we focus pretty much exclu exclusively on uh, UK insolvency litigation uh, and the big attraction of insolvency claims, the so claims in bust companies and bankrupt individuals, is uh, you can uh, almost always buy that case off, off the liquidator or off the administrator. You can't buy it off the trustee in bankruptcy. Maybe we can change the law on that in due course. Uh, but, we, but most of the far the majority of our claims are uh, corporate claims. So you'll see at the bottom of that slide of the new investments uh, done in this last financial year, 93% of them were duly purchased and just a small rump of 7% uh, were on a uh, funded model. And the benefits of uh, owning the claim is, of course, you have complete control. Um, you can choose the timing of when you issue uh, the letter for action, uh, whether you want to offer mediation, attend mediation, make all the decisions at a mediation, and then whether to issue um, uh, a claim through the courts, etc. So um, absolute full control, which is really, I think, a key differentiator um, between Manley and, and all other um, public and, and almost all private uh, third party funders. But the addressable market is large in the UK alone. Professor Peter Walton has done several um, reports now, um, most of which were done for the trade body R3. We financed the latest one just for him to update his numbers. Uh, and that um, pointed to an addressable market of about £1.5 billion a year in insolvency claims, of which about half that is recovered. Um, litigation funding, which is where we sit in that pie, accounts for about 20%, about three, four years ago, it's more like 10%. So the share of the funders is going up. And Manley's share of that funded share is 67%. So we're by far the market leader uh, in this uh, sector. Um, the next largest to us has just got a 2% share of that funded segment. Um, so we're, we're pretty dominant position. <clears throat> the final point there is there were two very important uh, legal changes that really expanded uh, our uh, opportunity in 2015, there was a Small Business Enterprise and Employment Act, which enabled us to buy not only the insolvent companies' claims, uh, for example, an unlawful dividend or uh, uh, overdrawn director's loan account, we were also now able from that date to buy the insolvency practitioners' claims, which arise on the insolvency event. So, um, for example, a, uh, a liquidator can go back six months and two years um, to, to raise new claims, to, to claw back transactions back for the benefit of creditors. So that was very um, that was very favourable to us that we could buy those, not just fund those and take control of them. The other point was in 2016, <clears throat> the Jackson reforms applied to uh, insolvency cases. They had applied to all other areas of the law in 2013 was applied to insolvency in 16, uh, and that made the incumbent uh, majority um, method of, of financing these claims, the no win, no fee um, CFA route, uh, allied with um, after the event insurance, um, very unattractive because from that moment on, any uh, doubled up legal costs, any AT premiums had to be paid out of the damages recovered from the uh, defendants. 
uh, and the costs of those uh, tended to be 200% the size of the damages. So it made a mockery, really, of the entire Insolvency Act because, because, of course, all the money just disappeared to the lawyers and the insurance companies, not to the creditors. Manalay is historic uh, and current, um, and I'm sure future cost ratio to damages is just 15 percent of the damages recovered so it really was um, a very big uh, breakthrough for 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 our model and there you can see the effects uh, of the model in our so-called vintages table which tracks uh, all 755 cases that we backed completed 505 and you'll see that uh, the large majority of uh, those cohorts of cases have been completed or have got literally one case left in them for the more recent years and the returns you'll see <clears throat> have uh, really jumped since the IPO in 2018. So they used to be around uh, 4 million, 7 million. They're now up to 14 million a year, uh, very consistently. 2021 last year, which is starting to mature, 57% completed, already 11 million. So when the other half completes, that should be obviously significantly higher than that. And those are done in a very short period of time, certainly in the world of litigation. The average is just 12 months across all those 505 cases, which is really unheard of in, in the legal world. And that is because we own the claim. We force resolution. We sit down with directors. We can, we can end the pain for them and just say, look, if you can agree on a reasonable settlement with us today, that's it, full and final settlement, and, and you can crack on with your, with your uh, business life and, and we can move on with our other cases. And the returns um, are the best that I personally have seen in um, in uh, the financial industry. I maybe put uh, Bitcoin aside for a minute, which uh, has somewhat high beta. But uh, I remember when I was um, graduating in accountancy, the private equity industry spoke with great pride, rightly so, of 30% compound returns over you know seven-year gestation period of a um, uh, venture capital portfolio. But um, you look at Manalay's returns a uh, year in, year out. Uh, IRRs of, of uh, well over 100%, uh, which is uh, just tremendous. The next slide really just picks up the highlights that uh, I've been talking through. We then look at the performance for um, uh, financial year 22, so ended March uh, uh, this year. Uh, and these really were, I would say, a historic uh, anathema. Uh, during the last two years, we've had to operate in a extraordinary, almost wartime legislation legislative uh, conditions of the government um, uh, legislating to suppress insolvencies in response to the COVID pandemic. So very understandably, the government wanted to protect jobs, livelihoods. So they made it very, very difficult to, um, to, 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 to make companies insolvent. So despite that, uh, our realised revenues, if you were to strip, up a, strip off a, a one-off, um, a very large case that we delivered last year, uh, were actually marginally slightly ahead if you did that on a more like for like basis and certainly in terms of the number of completed cases uh, they were even better than last year and operating within a pandemic um, I really take my head off to the team for producing uh, those results. Uh, there you can see the split of uh, realised and unrealised revenue good to see uh, a very large proportion all, all, always of realised revenue as the book rebuilds now of more uh, new cases that will probably be more balanced to 50-50 um, because of course they'll be unrealized at least for uh, a year while we're executing those but we'll, should then swing back to uh, to this kind of profile. And what was very interesting when Mark and I were analyzing the, the numbers is that the number of cases completed uh, accelerated actually really very fast into the, in the second half of uh, the financial year which is when really the whole of the UK was under the full grip of COVID operationally. Um, and we increased the number of case completions uh, by 67%. You can imagine the mediations and, and, and settlement meetings we were at with the directors and lawyers on the other side could have easily pointed to COVID reasons not to engage, not to settle, but they didn't. We forced uh, the ball over the line and into the back of the net time and time again. Um, and that really translates into cash, not just from last year, but uh, prior years as well, completed cases, uh, cash coming through from those. So that really was the highlight for, for us uh, this year, the very strong cash generation of the business. Um, the gross cash increased by 28% um, to a record 15.5 million. Uh, after you deduct the uh, creditors' share and the legal costs, they increased by 31% to 8.9 million pounds. 
there you can see the cash uh, profile uh, here. As we've always said, once we've completed a case, on average, there is uh, about a 12-month payment period, mainly from the smaller cases. We had a very large settlement post year end of nine and a half million pounds that was paid in less than three weeks in full. Uh, there was a case that uh, we settled just last week uh, for 700,000 pounds and the payment plan on that is, uh, is just six weeks. And until they pay, uh, there are uh, restrictions that we have on their residential properties. And if they miss any payments, we, we stack demand, we then issue for bankruptcy. And sadly, um, if they still don't pay, we, we um, take a charge and on the house and, and sell the house. Over the page, um, again, an interesting feature of the two halves of the year. Uh, the second half of the year saw 71% um, uh, or 72% of the cash um, received. So you'll see in, for example, October, of the two million pounds of cash coming into our accounts of cases, three and a half million December, and then two and two again in February and March. So very, very strong cash engine um, being driven, not just by this year's cases, as I say, the latency of uh, prior year cases as well. And then the first 10 weeks of the new financial year, we brought in 12 and a half million pounds. That was obviously the big nine and a half, but also another three million pounds from 109 separate granular cases. Uh, looking at cash um, operating statements, this is the way I kind of look at things. I, I get rather confused nowadays with um, the statutory presentation of cash. So from a kind of businessman's perspective, if we look at FY22, we brought in, as, as I said before, 15.5 million. We paid out of that to the creditors, 5.8 million, uh, 800,000 in legal costs. That leaves a, a Manalay profit, if you like, of 8.9 million. Overheads, uh, cash overheads, 4.5, and then corporation tax 0.8. So that was a net inflow. Oh, the only thing missing is our investment in new cases, which obviously deliver these uh, very strong returns. So that was 400% uh, up on last year on a like-for-like -like cash basis. I touched on the government's <coughs> restrictions on the insolvency um, on the insolvency market. Most of those came away uh, and reverted back to normal on the 1st of October 2021. The remainder came away in March 22. I think importantly, at the same time, furlough was withdrawn and various other supports for rent and rates and, and what have you were also withdrawn. So we were getting back to a normal world, but having had numbers suppressed, of course, in terms of insolvency. And there graphically, um, this is from the insolvency service, this data, they announce uh, their numbers uh, every month, uh, usually around mid-month, worth, worth having a look, because it is a um, very good early indicator of, of where our numbers uh, will go. So you can see there in um, June 2020, uh, the uh, legislation was passed in an immediate sharp dive in the number of uh, insolvencies of, of all types. And then they slowly started to lift as people um, started to realize that the government would overturn these. They, they said they were going to several locations and then finally they did. In October 21, the temporary measures uh, started being lifted. Um, and at, around that time, the number of insolvencies in the UK started reaching um, uh, the, the same level as they were uh, pre-pandemic in overall terms. And certainly CVLs, which is where we get most of our uh, cases from uh, had even uh, surpassed the pre-pandemic levels before. And as you could see, the trajectory on the number of insolvencies is almost a uh, vertical line in uh, the last month as the uh, full uh, support measures were withdrawn. And that clearly for Manalay, certainly not other parts of the economy, very sadly, um, but for Manalay, that really is um, a, a dramatic trajectory for our business in a very positive way. And that um, starts to um, reflect now in our numbers. So there's always a time lag between um, an insolvency happening and then that turning into a case inquiry on this slide. So you can see where we peaked and how it dropped after the law change came through and how it's coming back strongly now. And I've added this next graph, which uh, encapsulates the current quarter. Um, uh, so you can see Q1 uh, F FY23, uh, the numbers just to date. So we're missing, you know, um, uh, 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 10 days or so of uh, of the data for, for that last quarter. But the 
the line of, uh, of, of trajectory of the uh, new case inquiries is, is rising strongly. The one interruption was Omicron, uh, which just hampered the IPs and the lawyers referring cases in uh, the last quarter of the year. And then as we move down the life cycle of a, of a case, um, this reflects into signed cases for Manalays. So there you see a very strong increase in, in, the, in the years before, uh, sorry, leading, up, leading on from IPO to the, uh, to the lockdown. Um, the business increased something like 400% in those kind of two years, uh, but then of course slowed down dramatically in response to the legislative change, but is now starting to move upwards again. Um, and in fact, um, having had just seven cases signed up in April uh, 2020, as it, Omicron uh, blew itself out in our market, uh, that jumped to 17 in May, and we're already at 17 in June. So that's that's getting back to um, pre-pandemic levels for Manalay now as well, not just the market. Um, our record number of cases in a month was 26, so we're going to start nibbling away at that before too long. Looking forward, well, no one has a crystal ball in this uh, crazy world that we all live in at the moment with uh, wars and, and COVID, etc. But I think across the board, um, almost all respected um, third party commentators on the market are predicting a uh, elevated and uh, elongated rise in the number of uh, UK insolvencies. And certainly when you look at strikes, you look at inflation, you look at interest rates increasing, um, uh, in the USA and, and also in Europe and the UK, um, I think we can all agree it, it only points to uh, an elevated level of insolvency activity over the foreseeable future. On cartel cases, uh, we've kept the uh, valuation of these cases um, uh, uh, unchanged for the last two years as COVID slowed down the Competition and uh, Appeals Tribunal Court. Uh, that's all uh, back on now. BT and Royal Mail, uh, the, the two leading cases, are currently being tried in the courts. Uh, the judge has stayed all other claims, which means he's put them in the freezer because he's suggesting once he uh, makes his uh, 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 judgment on the level of overcharge and whether that should be reduced for any pass on, etc., what the interest should be, should be uh, there should be a strong read across to um, the many other similar claims, including our 22 claims. Uh, that one can apply, and I think he's rather hoping that uh, some sensible commercial settlement discussions will start at that stage. So we're expecting the trial to last nine weeks. We expect the judgment to come out within two or three months after that, um, and uh, and that's when um, it, it'll be fairly uh, ripe territory for some uh, grown-up conversations to be had. We will certainly be issuing our claims. We've now got everything ready for that, and uh, things start to get very interesting there. The QC who's been advising us uh, throughout this, a specialist from Moncton Chambers, one of the leading chambers for competition law, um, had previously um, advised us, to, uh, well, didn't really advise, the focus had been on the two biggest Manley uh, claims, which are CityLink and Comet. Uh, what he did advise us is that we should issue on all 22 claims. There was no reason why not. Um, having seen um, the particulars of claims from, uh, from, from BT and Royal Mail. So that's what we've done. So clearly the valuation now reflects the 22 claims rather than just the two that we had before. Um, close to wrapping up, so two uh, additions to the board. I'll start with Annie at the bottom because this was previously announced. Uh, Long-standing partner at PwC has joined us our chair of audit committee um, and has built a very strong relationship with Mark uh, very quickly, which I'm delighted about. The new one that starts tomorrow is um, our long-serving uh, head of legal, uh, Mina Halton, Philomena Halton, uh, joins the board um, uh, of Manalay. Mina's been with us for eight years. She's worked on literally hundreds of cases and delivered very strong returns for our shareholders. Delighted for her to, to join our board. I'm going to hand it over to Mark now to control the slides. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so I'll run you through the uh, the the financial statements. Um, so as Stephen has already alluded to, in overall terms, FY22 was a, a challenging environment because of the, the unprecedented level of government support um, delaying insolvencies. So with, with that background, we signed um, 159 new cases during the year, which was down on the previous year when we signed 198 new cases. We did, however, complete um, a record number of cases, 139 case completions compared to 135 
um, in the previous year, which has really driven our cash generation you'll see in, in later slides. Um, so looking at the, the profit and loss, uh, we recorded gross revenue of 20.4 million in the year compared to 27.8 million in the previous year. The prior year was boosted by a, a, a one-off large um, case that completed at 9.3 million. So if you normalize for this case, you, you have a prior year realized revenue of 15.1 uh, prior year against um, 15.2 million this year, which is a a more understandable comparison given the number of, of case completions. Um, our unrealized revenue relates to the increase of our valuations on our ongoing cases and the 5.2 million um, almost entirely relates to the uplift in our cartel, the valuation of our cartel cases um, that Stephen previously mentioned. Um, our valuation now relates to all 22 of the cartel cases that we hold. Um, this resulted in a gross margin of 51%, which compares favourably to last year's 48%. Um, overhead costs decreased by 0.9 million in the year uh, compared to last year as we continue to manage costs um, carefully during the year. Uh, this all resulted in an EBIT of 5.3 million for the year compared to 7.4 in uh, the previous year. Um, if I could just draw your attention to the revenue composition in the bottom left hand side, uh, this shows our realized revenue, so actual case completions um, versus unrealized, which is a, an amendment to the, to the valuation of ongoing cases. So the, the vast proportion, higher proportion of revenue relating to actual um, completions. Um, so I'll just go on to the balance sheet on the next slide. Um, so we've continued to build our portfolio of cases during FY22. And you'll see uh, the investments balance where we hold the fair value of the um, live cases um, has increased during the year. So investment in cases, both non-current and current, uh, was 45.7 million um, at the end of March 22, compared to 37.5 million in the previous year. So the current balance relates to 274 live cases compared to 245 live cases in the previous year. Um, as I previously mentioned, the cartel cases is the uh, long-term investment, the 12.2 million figure that you see there. Um, we hold trade receivables, both short-term and long-term, of 20.5 million at the year end, compared to 18.4 in the previous year, so a small increase um, over the year. We held cash of 2.2 million at the year end, and our debt drawback down on our HSBC loan was 13.5. Um, million, which gave us 11.5 million of unutilized uh, core core facility. Um, post the year end, we have repaid um, 4.5 million of the loan. As Stephen mentioned, there was a large case that completed in in April, which gave us cash resources. So the um, the drawn down portion of HSBC loan as of today is 9 million. Just turning to the cash flow. Um, so gross cash receipts in the year were 15.5 million compared to 12.2 in the previous year. There's an increase of 28% driven by both um, completions during the year and payment schedules of, of prior year completions. We, we typically on the smaller cases um, agree uh, scheduled payments for the defendant. So the, the cash flow is, is over a, a number of months. Um, cash flow from completed cases after payments to our insolvency practitioner partners and payment of legal fees, um, still a very healthy positive 8.9 million. Um, our overheads have increased slightly in the year, 4.5 million compared to 4 million of the previous year. And we've continued to invest in new cases and the existing portfolio. 6.5 million was invested in cash during the year compared to 5.9 in the previous year. Corporation tax, was slight, tax payments were slightly lower due to the lower level of profits, and I've already mentioned the, um, the HSBC loan. Um, just looking at our aging, aging of trade receivables balance, it's an area where we've um, um, had some interest in the past. Um, I've cut the data in two ways. The aging by the settlement date of the, um, the agreement, which shows that 55% of debtors uh, related to settlements that have been reached in the last six months, so very 
very current. And then the second um, graph, the lower graph, aging by the due date. So this is taking into account the agreed phasing of the payments. And as you can see, the vast majority of our trade receivables are not, are not yet due. So um, that's quite a healthy profile there. Um, just to look at um, the cash collection, again, just making this point that cash comes in gradually over a period of time. Um, this graph shows for each month in the prior year um, of the realised revenue, what proportion of the cash have, have we already collected as at the year end. Um, so the dark proportion of the bar chart shows the proportion of cash received and the lighter pink um, uh, proportion of the bar graph shows the proportion still to be collected. Um, and that proportion will all come in really over the next uh, 12 months. And the final slide, just to give an update uh, on our HSBC loan. So um, as of June 2021, we extended our, our facility of HSBC to 25 million for the core facility. Plus we've got an additional um, uncommitted accordion facility for a further 10 million if, if ever required. Um, our interest cost is a maximum of 2.9% above SONIA, which is the Sterling Overnight Index average rate. Um, and as of this week, we've also just taken out um, a one-year extension to the facility. So it now runs to June 2025. So um, that means we're well positioned to take advantage of the, um, the upcoming um, increase in insolvencies. Great, that's, that's all for me. Back to you, Stephen. That's great. Um, that's actually the end of the presentation. So um, if I hand back to our host, just on Q&A. That's great, Stephen. Mark, thank you very much indeed for updating investors this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while Stephen and Mark take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your InvestorMeet company dashboard. Uh, Stephen, Mark, as you know, you received a, a number of questions ahead of today's event, and you've received quite a considerable number of questions throughout your, your presentation. So firstly, Thank you to all of those investors for your engagement uh, this afternoon. Uh, but perhaps if I may, Stephen and Mark, if I could hand back to you and to read out the questions and where appropriate, give a response and I'll pick up from you at the end. Super. So just looking at the questions, Mark, I think I'm going to give you the first one from Robert, who said, why was there a three million write down of cases in progress versus one million in the prior year? I don't know whether that is just a movement out of unrealized into realized or whether it's it's actually write downs uh, as such. Mark, can you shed any light on that? Uh, yeah, so that that's a, a combination of completion. So we take completions out of the um, investment, out of the um, unrealized revenue um, category and put it into realized and, and also, so we have been cautious with our valuations. So we, it, whenever um, we think a case isn't progressing as, as well as we might have thought, we, we immediately um, write the case down slightly in terms of its valuation. So we're constantly kind of reviewing the valuation of the cases um, and we have a kind of all company meeting every month then to, to check those, those valuations and go through on a case by case basis. Yes. And I think as the, as to answer the, the kind of uh, in, indirect kind of element of that question, Robert, I, I think as the portfolio grows bigger and bigger, both in terms of transfers mm -hmm. into completed cases and also conservative adjustments to any valuations, because um, that's the way we like it to be, um, there will there will always be cautious movements in, in, in that sector. But I wouldn't think of anything um, untoward. And I certainly can't. I was wrecking my, my brains as I was uh, reading the question if there was any one, two or five cases that, you know, alarmed us and it, that's just not the case. So I hope that's helpful. The next question is an uh, interesting one. Uh, Andrew asks, I realise you can't make detailed forecasts, but when do you expect to be running cash flow positive, including investments in new cases? I, when do you expect to be free cash flow positive? Um, it, it's a fantastic question, Andrew. There are times uh, during the year where we are hitting that. Uh, Mark's just mentioned that very recently we have paid down, I think Mark said, four and a half million pounds of our um, of our HSBC facility. So obviously that was excess cash above what we're investing in at the moment. Um, so that uh, hopefully gives a, a small current data point. However, on a more 
consistent long-term basis um i i think it's um it's a tricky question because i think having um had uh, insolvency cases suppressed so heavily by the government for the last two years um we are now looking at an environment of very very large opportunity for money mm-hmm. where it would be remiss of us not to invest heavily in high quality high return cases um so i must say as a as the ceo that will be my priority to to harvest those opportunities now rather than looking to kind of uh, minimize investment to maximize shareholder distribution i i i think the the thesis that, uh, that 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 we're running on is that now is a great time to be buying um record numbers of cases to harvest um two and a half times those investments looking at historic rates um in due course on those and when i say in due course that's usually one or two years down the track which isn't um uh, long in in the world of litigation so um i hope i hope that's a, a helpful answer but i can't be I can't be more um, precise uh, about that. I think the other thing that could lead to a positive, um, but more a one-off outcome there is the completion of the cartel cases, whether that's um, uh, calendar 22, whether that's calendar 23, um, uh, that uh, if all goes to plan there should deliver a one-off outsized uh, amount of cash and we will have to look at how uh, best to maximize shareholder return of that money when we when we see it in our, our in our account. Uh, moving on to the next one, Matthew R asked, "What part does M and A play in your strategy moving forward?" Excellent question. Um, the as I mentioned on the market shares, so you've got the whole of the market which is still dominated by the old and uneconomic way of this no win no fee. It's still 80% of the use, but as we educate the market. Um, the share of the funded slice moves up from 10% a few years ago to now 20%. Our mission is to uh, is to uh, tra- transfer all of that market onto, frankly, the Manalay way of doing things. And the judge who sat on our board for the last uh, three and a half years, Stephen Baster, uh, when he and I uh, sat down and discussed the, the model in his early days, his considered view, having been the most senior insolvency judge in the UK for about 17 years, his view was that all insolvency litigation should be done using our our method. Um, so that's the mission. Um, so uh, the, the, the point of this to M&A is that our next largest competitor only has 2% of the um, funded sec- sector of our market. So it really doesn't make any sense for us to um, tie up capital uh, or shares in, in acquiring uh, really uh, rather marginal competitors in, in our market. There is so much organic growth to go for, um, and uh, and that's what our money spent on. We added two new uh, uh, very clever heads to our legal team in January and February this year. There will likely be more additions made later this year, but really uh, very much an organic uh, strategy moving forward. Uh, Robert asks, um, whilst you anticipated more cases due to the effect of COVID, do you now anticipate even further cases due to the effect of inflation distressing companies further ahead? Uh, well, I do. Uh, and uh, and really, it's it's not directly inflation. It's, it's I think, uh, interest rates. We've had a whole army of zombie companies that uh, many accountants and lawyers have pointed to and politicians have pointed to suppressing the efficiency of the UK economy for the past 10, 12, 15 years. Uh, and these, a zombie is a company that can only pay its interest, it can't ever pay its uh, capital on its uh, uh, on its balance sheet. So by interest rates going up, uh, it's very likely it will tip a lot of these zombie companies uh, into liquidation. Frankly, I think that's a positive thing. These companies are not growth companies. They're not employing lots of new people. They're not paying lots of tax. So I think those assets being distributed to the stronger operators in their segments is the best thing for for the UK. David B, who I suspect I know, um, asked the carrying value of the cartel cases has increased substantially, correct? Please can you explain the re-rating assumptions? I hope I got that on the slide, David. So it's really two points um, in summary. Number one, having had these cases on our books for four years now, um, uh, and an awful lot of work done and over a million pounds spent on developing these cases. Um, we are now re- reaching what could well be the end game with the Royal Mail and uh, BT trials now well underway. Um, so that's point number one, uh, and, and that has only started recently. 
Point number two is um, the legal opinion from the QC and our solicitors that we should issue on all of our claims. We took a very um, conservative view in the past and just pinned everything on our two biggest cases, City Lick and, and Comet. Um, their view is that uh, we, the data we have and the claims we have in the other 20 companies uh, we should now issue on. And so obviously uh, evaluation is attributed to those. Mark, I suspect the next one is uh, for you. So David M, revenues for the year just ended were 92% higher than they were in the full year to March 18 of 10.6 million. However, latest profits are only 12% higher <laughs> than they were back then, 3.2 million. The EBIT margin appears to have fallen steadily over the years. What do you expect the EBIT margin to be in the future? David Martin, long-term holder. Mark. Great, thank you. Yeah, um... I'm impressed that you've compared it back to 2018. Um, and there's no particular. We, we don't. We don't foresee um, margins uh, falling. We, we we expect them to to hold very much around the, the the levels that we're at. Back back in 2018, there were so there were really so few cases that that margins could could fluctuate um, depending on one or two large cases. Whereas in the last two years, it's it's been much more of a a portfolio effect where you've got hundreds of cases so the, mar the margins are, are evening out now around the 50 percent in terms of gross margin so um I, I think we've got a lot more stable um environment than we, than we had back then i agree and certainly in all the modeling you did with hsbc uh, for the extension mark uh, i don't think we ever um saw in the in, in the various scenarios uh, any um uh, material decline in in, in gross no, margin yeah. coming out no, that's decline. right that's right yeah 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 uh, moving on to the next one david b uh, on a steady state basis uh, repeat steady state basis what would you envisage the realized to unrealized split to revenue be um so again super question um i'm expecting having had last two years very high level of realized to unrealized uh, I'm expecting as as we now go into a period of um, of uh, m many more case opportunity investment opportunities over the next year to 18 months to two years, I expect that to be much more balanced over the uh, short term, medium term, and then into steady state. As David's question asks, um, it, I I think the natural steady state for Manley will be something like 75 to 80 percent of realised and 25 to 20 percent unrealised. Um, there is not a huge amount of science to that uh, answer. It's just what feels uh, right as Mark was, as I was, I was pondering that question while Mark mm -hmm. was uh, answering the other one. I don't, Mark, I don't know what your feeling is. There's probably yeah, no, I, 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 think that's, I think that's spot on. Obviously, as we grow, the unrealized proportion increases. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, and I, I imagine going going forward, we're going to see the unrealized element grow again as as, as number yes. of cases increases. Yes, agreed, agreed. Um, David B, again, uh, how many litigation lawyers are employed and total staff number? So I believe we're up to 13 litigation lawyers uh, in-house. Total staff numbers, I think we're up to 24, Mark, if uh, I've got that right. Yes, yeah. In including the board, I think. Yes, including um, the board. Uh, Paul S, have Mano ever had any interest from large legal firms or other entities with regards to acquisition? As a shareholder, I'm looking to establish what long-term yeah. goal is for Mano in terms of longevity valuation. Right, let's get the takeover panel on the line. Um, no, <laughs> no, uh, no, no, we haven't. Uh, if if we had or we were in any discussions, I, I you would see you would have seen an RNS about it. And Paul, I do. We keep being uh, given these teachings by our uh, by our nomad, of course, every year on on uh, anything like this. So um, I won't dwell on this too long because it, it it would be market and price sensitive. Um, please don't read anything untoward or uh, in, you know, unusually interested in that comment. It's, it's just uh, it's something that we shouldn't talk about. Um, James E. Debt uh, one for you, I think. Mark debt is mm. linked to Sonia, short term variable. In the inflationary environment in which we find ourselves, rates are climbing fast. Would it be preferable to lock in a fixed term rate to hedge against rate risk? Um, good, good question. I've, uh, I've been talking to HSBC about hedges, actually. Um, at the moment, we're happy with the, the Sonia rate. Uh, we are watching it carefully. Um, HSBC have been very supportive of the business and um, 
uh, I'm sure they'll continue to be if, if we want to change into a, a, a kind of different interest rate um, arrangement. Agreed, agreed. And, and it's, it's very difficult, crystal ball, you know, some people are thinking that this inflation will peak um, uh, relatively soon. I just think it's, it's more embedded into the system. So um, I, I think, we'll, we'll, as Mark says, a very close watch and brief on that and what's best for the company, of course. Um, Paul S asks, what is Mythac's long-term aim to the company? Are they in for the long term or do they have a valuation time horizon to begin selling down? Well, I'm delighted someone's asked me this. So in the um, conversations I've had with uh, Mythac, who have struck me as very intelligent uh, operators and people probably know they've got a large position in uh, at least one other uh, litigation, a quality litigation funder, um, they have told me uh, that they are a very, very long term uh, shareholder in the business. Um, and that really is the long and the short of it. There is no target price which they would trigger them. Uh, there's no target valuation. They're not looking us to be in some roll up with their other investments. No, nothing of the sort. Um, so I hope um, that that helps there. Paul, Paul asks uh, another question. How big is the opportunity on working with HMRC, Fortune and Bounce Back Loan Claims, other government schemes abused during the COVID? Well, this really is the golden question, Paul. You win the prize. Um, it is the big question. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of bounce back loans out there already in default, many of which were raised fraudulently, uh, and the value of those uh, is, is, is around £10 billion. Uh, Lord Agnew, uh, the business minister, resigned on the back of this uh, calamity. Uh, him saying that uh, the banks didn't do enough to uh, check that these were valid claims for these schemes. Manalay has already been collecting and completing and collecting the cash in on bounce back loans within the insolvent companies just in the normal course. There are now emerging opportunities for very high volume um, application of our model to, uh, to, to, to this market. Uh, I can't say more than that at the moment. I'd say watch this space, but all sorts of fantastic opportunities. It kind of goes back to the answer, actually, to the when are you going to start um, having free cash flow after investment? I think we, 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 because we're looking at, at these kind of opportunities, um, uh, it, we, we just think in shareholder interest, it'd be right to deploy that cash into what could be very attractive uh, pool of uh, claims. Uh, reaching, I think, towards the end. So James E., if the... TAM is a uh, totally addressable market is 1.5 billion. Uh, the Manalay way, as opposed to no win, no fee, accounts for 20%. And Manalay is 67% of the business. That should reconcile to 200 million. Can't work aside. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I work the numbers this way as well, James. What it says on that slide, uh, although the address book, the headline claim is um, claimed to for 1.5 billion, if you, if you look at the, the next sentence on the slide, it says that the um, the, what's actually recovered, which is the most important thing, is about half that amount. Um, so that takes you to, to 750 million. Um, if you then, 20%, uh, yes, 20% um, is, is, is a more current figure. I think if you, you flex that to, I think when Walton did his report, please do, it's all online, please refer to, I think he's, he's got us, the group of us at more like 15%, of which Manalea is 65%. And I think that gets you close-ish to um, our uh, gross revenue numbers. And what you need to be careful of there is to, is to inflate up the funded cases because we only recognize our profit share in our revenue, not the gross recovery. So you've got to be careful you're, you're dealing apples with apples there, James. Um, have a go at the numbers. Uh, if you can't get near, and I remember our analyst at Peel Hunt, we had all sorts of hair tearing out when uh, Peter Walton was putting this together. We, we finally got comfortable with it. Please do drop me an email and, uh, and we'll take you through our logic in, in a bit more detail. Uh, finally, uh, Lionel says, what is the staff capacity to handle um, additional and increasing case load? Great question. What would be the trigger for a share price? re-rate based on the growing case flow that will come to the second one second. So staffing capacity, as I said, 13 in-house lawyers. Um, they should all be capable of uh, managing about 30 to 40 cases at any one time. We've currently got live at about 275 cases. So our capacity is more like 400. So for the next increase in, in volume that comes that is coming through as we speak, as you saw from the slides, 
uh, there is no uh, increase in, in, in overhead costs needed to, uh, to manage that beyond 400 live cases, which would put, put us in a profit realm that we've never been before, much higher than pre-pandemic, because we were running at about, I think, 150, 200 live cases at that time, and we're talking 400 live cases. So we would be in a very, very strong uh, profit position at that stage if we reach, uh, if and when we reach that capacity. That's when we would start adding people. On the bounce back loan side, if we start seeing a high volume of the smaller value claims, which we believe we can make very good margins on, um, we will be staffing that up completely separately. We have a completely separate in-house plan for that. I'd like to keep that obviously between ourselves because that's rather proprietary. Um, but uh, yeah, to scale that business, it's a much lower cost um, uh, uh, legal brains going into that. One final one has just jumped in. Oh, sorry, I missed out what will trigger the share price re-rate based on the growing caseload. Um, Lionel, uh, I don't know. I, I, you know I, I'm not in the market. I'm, I'm not in the minds of the analysts. Um, uh, I don't know what uh, KPIs we're going to have to hit for them to start, um, you know, increasing uh, ratings of uh, of Manley. And I'm sure you're a much better public market investor than than I am. Uh, James E. Finally, on this this once a lifetime opportunity in place of Manley on the back of the forthcoming tidal wave from the subsidies means that the years of future growth can be brought forward. Do you have the capacity and resource, human and capital, to capa- capitalise on this opportunity to the full? Um, well, I hope I've answered the uh, the human resource capacity. On the uh, finance side, yes, I do. Mark and I have spent a lot of time with auditors um, in terms of working capital and uh, HSBC in terms of financial uh, firepower. And under um, all our stretch scenarios, including very high volume uptick over the next um, 12 to 24 months, um, we are well within our organic as well as our uh, debt facilities and covenants, of course, critically. Um, And I would just point you to the very high organic cash generation this last financial year. And the fact in the first 10 weeks of this financial year, we brought in more money than for the entirety of the FY20 uh, uh, year, so FY21 year, I think it was, uh, I checked myself. Um, So um, yes, the model is throwing off a lot of cash in and of itself. I add to that Mark's point about uh, repaying a a very large chunk of of debt um, uh, just very recently. So um, hopefully that has covered all the questions as ever. I think people understand our style. Um, that um, we are contactable, uh, contactable at any time, and those of you who do contact us, you, you usually get a response uh, within 24 hours. So um, the lines always open. I'll hand back to our host. That's great, Mark, Stephen. Thank you very much indeed for updating investors uh, this afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do not close the session as we will now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback. To, so the company can better understand your views and expectations. This may take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be highly valued and welcomed by the Indeed. company. Um, if I may, um, Stephen, I, unless there's any further comments, I will then close the session unless you have um, any other further comments. No, I, I think we've covered a lot of ground with some super questions, so thank you very much indeed. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you once again, uh, Stephen and Mark, for your time. And as I said, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback. On behalf of the management team of Manalay Partners PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session, and thank you and good afternoon to you all.